Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. We're going to be reacting to history and history-related shorts and memes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of short-form history content out there now, and I felt like this would be uh, sort of a good thing to try. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you would let me know if you enjoyed this. Uh, if you did, leave a like on the video or leave a comment. And if you want to support the channel, please subscribe and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. Without any further ado, let's get into this video. Many scholars use the term Byzantine Empire for the Eastern Roman Empire, but... Alright, starting with some Byzantine or Roman content, whatever you want to call it, I suppose that's the topic of this short. It's hilariously, this is a term that was coined in the 16th century in Western Europe, a hundred years after the fall of Constantinople by a mm. scholar with the name of Hieronymus Wolf. He was the one to first introduce the term Byzantine Empire, but the Eastern Romans did not even know this, this term. This is true. They always saw themselves as Roman yep. and Greek Romaioi. The Western European kingdoms, however, wanted to delegitimize the Eastern Romans as not being the true successors of mm -hmm. the Roman Empire, and so this term was used as a derogatory term to degrade the Eastern and Romans to mere Greeks and to both. Yeah, so I, I don't know anything about the origins of the term Byzantine, but I can talk a little bit about Roman identity. This is exactly right. Uh, the Byzantines did see themselves as Romans, you know, throughout their entire history. Um, and that's how the Ottomans, you know, the, well, I don't know if you'd call them the successors to the Byzantine Empire, but the Ottomans are who controlled the land. They took it over from the Byzantines. Uh, and they also saw the uh, Eastern Orthodox Greeks, or the Byzantines, as Romans. That's what they called them, too. So, you know, they held on to their Roman identity. They held on to their claim of Roman legacy. And like I said, I don't know about the origins of the term Byzantine. But it is true that the Western world... Uh, the Latins, they also tried to lay claim to uh, the Roman legacy. Because the Byzantines, obviously, or the Eastern Romans, obviously had the best claim to Roman identity and the Roman legacy. But the West, say, for example, with the creation of the Holy Roman Empire, they wanted to lay their own claim to the Roman legacy. Um, and a lot of this became tied up with Christianity. You know, the, uh, the Western Christians, the Catholics wanted to say, no, we are the true successors to Rome. And the Eastern Orthodox Christians, um, the Greek Orthodox Christians, the Byzantines, they also wanted to say, no, we are the true claimants to the Roman legacy. Uh, and I think they have a far stronger claim. Um, and I don't know if we shouldn't use the term Byzantine anymore. I think it is a useful term to show sort of uh, a separation in time periods. Uh, it's sort of a useful way of explaining things. But we should recognize that there is sort of a continuous thread between the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. Uh, you know, I often use the terms interchangeably. I call the Byzantine Empire the Roman Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire um, because they were still Romans to their own claims to the succession of Rome. So if you would travel back in time to 1000 AD and call the Eastern Romans Byzantines, you would likely end beaten up in the back alley of Constantinople. Thus, I personally try to avoid the term Byzantine Empire or Byzantine mm. the best I can, and I'm quite surprised to find many scholars adapting this derogatory term so willingly. I want to call the people of the Eastern Roman Empire what they truly were, namely Romans, and not use a made-up term well. by a biased 16th century historian. Many. Okay, so... I see the point. I think that the term has evolved over time, and it's not a derogatory term anymore. Uh, like I said, I'm unfamiliar with the origins of the term Byzantine. I, I think nowadays it is a useful term to show sort of a separation of time periods, because there is definitely a lot of change from the Roman Empire to the collapse of the West and then the Eastern Roman Empire, and it can be worthwhile showing that change with a different term. You know, the Roman Empire of the year 1000 AD is very different from the Roman Empire of the year 1 AD, um, or, you know, whatever year you want to choose. And so I think the term Byzantine can be used to show that. So I wouldn't say, like, oh, you shouldn't use it as derogatory, but it's also fair to call them Romans, because they are Romans. This is a fantastic piece of kit. You have an 80% ah, chance. We get some uh, World War I medicine. Very curious. ...of dying if you fracture your femur. What Ugh. happens is the leg is placed through here, like this. Mm. Obviously, you'd be lying down on the stretcher. What happens when you break your femur? 
if you imagine that's your femur, it shatters, you've got very powerful muscles, it pulls it across like that. Putting your leg in this contraption here, it mm. pulls it down, pulls the bones back into location, Ouch. it re -knits them, it stabilizes them, and it changes the statistics from an 80% chance of dying to an 80% chance of surviving. I mean, hey, that's not bad. Uh, I mean, it looks like sort of a relatively simple contraption, but, you know, you have to remember that in the 19th century, we're talking the mid to late 1800s, there was really, I'd say, a revolution in medicine. Uh, and stuff started to get a lot better, our handling of diseases in particular. Now, when we talk about World War I, the deaths from diseases are still insanely high um, compared to later wars. But stuff is slowly improving over time, uh, and this invention is a part of that. Can you guess the country from these five facts? This Let's nation see. lays claim to one of the world's largest sink mines. So this country has never hosted the Olympics itself. Every mm -hmm, nation mm -hmm. it borders has at least once. This place is one of the few countries in the world without a single native species of snakes. What? Christianity was widely introduced to this place in the 5th century by a very famous saint. And lastly, this country was the origin for many of today's Halloween traditions. Oh, this is Ireland. nation is... Ireland. Did hey, you there we go. Can you snakes, uh, the Christianity one and the Halloween one? That's what did it for me. Uh, I had no idea up until that point, but there we go. We got Ireland. Shout out to our our Irish brothers and sisters out there. <laughs> How did the Roman Empire become Christian? During the early years, Rome was polytheistic. Well, In fact, Romans were surprisingly one special little emperor. <laughs> the un-Roman when it came to religion, the general belief being that all gods, even the gods of their enemies, existed. Christ well, yeah, Rome uh, integrated a lot of other gods. In fact, if you look at the Roman pantheon, it's in many ways just a copy of the Greek pantheon, the Greek gods. Um, and so there was a lot of adoption of other religions or other religious figures into Roman religious ideas. Not to mention that as the empire expanded, you know, there was quite a diversity in religious opinion. There were lots of different religions within the empire, and the Romans were pretty lax, pretty tolerant uh, on a religious basis until much later when Christianity was induced, or introduced. Christianity was something of a black sheep, however, mostly because it claims that Roman emperors were in fact not gods. Well, Christianity began as sort of a religion of the underclass. Uh, it was a religion of slaves, of the poor, of women, of people who were, you know, treated badly, who were at the bottom of the social hierarchy within Rome. Um, and that, that sort of makes sense. If you look at Christianity, um, you know, it sort of celebrates those people, celebrates the meek. Uh, and so that's sort of where it began. And, and those are the circles it began to spread within. This resulted in some pretty horrific persecution, which I'm sure many True. of you are aware of, including feeding Christians to lions and even using them as human torches to light up parties. Everything began to change during the crisis of the 3rd century, where all social order broke down within the empire. During this period, Christians offered relief to the poor and starving, gaining yeah. the religion thousands of converts. Yeah, and so this is exactly right. As the empire started to crumble uh, in you know, the crisis of the 3rd century, it, this is a bad period, and so a lot of people are falling on hard times. A lot of people want a more concrete religious belief to turn to, and Christianity is really in the right position to fill that role. Though I will say, a lot of other religions and cults grew during this time period, you know, appealing to people who were desperate or who just needed something to keep them going. Later emperors would realize the value of Christianity within the empire, and eventually it would be accepted as the state religion. What a journey from the bottom to the top. Yes, and that was Constantine. Uh, you know, he made Christianity the religion of the empire, though it was already pretty popular at that point. There were still emperors who tried to persecute it, um, but Constantine made it official. Why did legionaries carry wooden stakes? Roman legionaries Dunno. carried everything they needed on their back, earning them the nickname Marius's Mules after the Roman general <laughs> who created the system. This included food, armor, and weaponry, and all the materials needed to construct a military camp, including mm. a wooden stake for the defensive outer perimeter. I mean, we've talked about this many times on this channel, but Romans were famous for their engineering, their construction. Uh, you know, I feel like if the Roman military fought half the time, they were building the other half the time. I mean, through watching 
Historia Civilis videos, we've seen them building bridges, camps, walls, trenches, and they were really well known for that infrastructure. This is especially impressive as they were expected to march for 8 hours with 30 kilos of kit and then construct this camp before settling down for the evening meal. Mm. It also demonstrated how highly organized the Roman military was in stark contrast to their enemies. Yeah, Every true. legionary would know exactly where he should be in- I mean, the Roman legionaries, the legions, were incredibly well trained, disciplined, and experienced compared to the enemies they were fighting. I mean, they faced- uh, a lot of tribal enemies, confederations, you know, they just were not fighting anybody else on their level, except for maybe, like, the Persians, or, uh, you know, maybe the Carthaginians earlier on, although they definitely were at the same level uh, as the Romans. Um, you know, the Romans were facing a lot of smaller polities and entities, not a lot of big empires. What his job was before the order to make camp was given. A big reason for the fall of Rome was that the Romans never managed to establish an order succession system to the throne mm. until the bitter end when Constantinople and the last Roman strongholds fell in the mid 15th century there were time and time again civil wars where new emperors arose that fought against the previous one. This is true Rome had notoriously uh, dramatic succession crises uh, there was a lot of drama a lot of infighting a lot of political tension Sometimes, very rarely, there was a clear succession. You know, father rules, passes it down to his adult son, bam, we're done. But that was exceptionally rare. Oftentimes, there was fighting between factions, uh, different lines, different leaders who had certain levels of legitimacy, and, and this was an issue throughout the history of the empire. Perhaps because, you know, the republic was usurped, and, you know, it wasn't... Like, there was a clear transition process, it just sort of happened, and there was, you know, nothing established early on. It wasn't like, well, this is how dynastic succession works. It didn't go like that. And so, this is true, there was a lot of drama throughout Roman history. I think the Byzantine Empire, in particular, had a lot of, sort of, court intrigue about who would succeed the empire or the emperor. Once There were usurpers throughout Roman history, left and right, and in fact these constant civil wars did so much damage to the Roman Empire that external enemies could prevail. Only for brief periods did the Romans manage to establish an ordered succession system as in mm. the case of the five good emperors in the 2nd century AD, where the emperor adopted a successor based on competence and merit. Yeah, I mean there were some dynasties throughout Roman history that did do a good job, this is probably the best example, that did do a good job of having an ordered succession. But it usually was not like that, and they're exactly right that when the Romans were fighting each other, that left the empire open to attack from external enemies. However, this system only lasted for 90 years, and as soon as it failed, so did the huge problems for the empire start. This lack mm. of succession system led to countless usurpers and civil wars in the Roman Empire, which made it easy for the barbarian invaders to overrun the West. And without the Western Roman Empire, the fate of the Eastern Roman Empire was also sealed. Well, I mean, I think there were a lot of reasons <laughs> that the Roman Empire fell. And to be fair, you know, the West fell. And then the East continued for like a thousand more years. So that's definitely simplified. But the complex succession processes absolutely contributed to the downfall of the Roman Empire. If you look at a map of the United mm. Kingdom, you will notice that the Isle of Man is not part of it. But why is that? I believe, and I could be wrong, it's because it is the, uh, the personal property of... Uh, the monarch, who well, I guess is now King Charles, um, the Isle of Man, and a couple of other islands, uh, Jersey and Guernsey, the Channel Islands, I believe they're called. I think it's because they're the personal property of the monarch. Uh, we'll see if I'm correct. That the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands, Guernsey and Jersey, are crown dependencies. Ah, there we go. That they're the personal property of the crown. The head of state is King Charles III, the King of the United Kingdom. The Crown Dependencies have their own parliaments, governments, and laws. Wow. The United Kingdom is the only responsible- I didn't know they were so independent, though. ...responsible for the defense and international relations, similar to the relations between India and Bhutan. Though it should be said that the citizens of the Crown Dependencies are British citizens, yet have different passports than citizens of the UK. Huh. If you look at a map of the- Very interesting. I, I knew, well, clearly, that- they were owned personally by the king or queen, 
but I didn't know that they had such a high level of political autonomy. That's fascinating. Possible new countries that could soon exist. All Quebec right. is technically part of Canada. Well, it's more than technically part of Canada. It's part of Canada. Uh, yeah, you could see Quebec secession down the line. I mean, I wouldn't suspect it in the next couple of years, but you could definitely imagine that happening at some point. But the region was settled by the French, not the English, which is why French is still spoken. I mean, Quebec has a very strong cultural identity, and even if they don't want full secession, they will definitely continue to go for more autonomy from the rest of Canada over time. That's absolutely true. Today. Belgium, on the other hand, is only half French. The country is divided into a more Dutch northern part and a more French southern part. Bougainville. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if they'll uh, divide, though. I think that they can definitely stay together. Will peacefully secede from Papua New Guinea in 2027. Speaking of peace, Somaliland wants to secede from the rest of the country and become its own state. Well, you see a lot of examples throughout Africa of different ethnic groups or nations that want to secede from the state that they're currently a part of. I mean, this is largely due to the fact that, um, you know, prior to European colonization, there were certainly some uh, nation states throughout Africa, but it was not nearly as widespread. And then Europe showed up, said, well, we sort of need to organize this continent as we've organized our own continent drew a bunch of borders and left uh, and many of those borders don't really work out you know they've separated uh, ethnic groups from you know their fellow people they've grouped a bunch of different nations together so it's a very complicated situation throughout Africa and a lot of their borders aren't doing them any favors and while we're on the subject of secession Hawaii hasn't forgotten that it used to be a sovereign state with its own identity before it sure and Hawaii still has a strong identity, but I'd be surprised if they secede from the Union. I mean, first off, uh, the last time that was tried, it didn't end well, ended in a civil war. Second off, I'm not sure if Hawaiians even want to secede from the United States. But was forced to join the Union. Scotland is also not happy about mm. the UK's decision to leave the EU, which could lead... Oh, okay, we ended it there. I, I think the Scotland one is definitely going... To happen. Scotland already voted for independence in 2014, I believe. Uh, they voted no, but that was prior to Brexit. Uh, now, if you look at the voting numbers, uh, Scotland overwhelmingly voted to stay in the EU, whereas England voted to leave. Uh, and what that led to was Brexit. You know, the United Kingdom left the European Union. Scotland is not very happy about that. And so support for Scottish independence has been rising since that happened. And if uh, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, gets her way, which she probably will, Scotland's going to have another independence referendum, and it's probably going to vote yes this time. So that is one that I definitely could see happening in the near future. Like, I'm talking the next couple of years. The only barrier is can... Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP, the Scottish Nationalist Party, uh, the ruling party of Scotland, can they convince the Tory government of Britain to allow them to hold an independence referendum? If not, will they just do it illegally? What's going to happen? I don't know, but I could definitely see Scotland seceding from the EU very soon. One of the most counterintuitive reasons for the fall of Rome was that yes. the army of the Roman Empire was just too damn large. You know, I don't know if that's counterintuitive necessarily. If your army is too large, one, it can become unsustainable. You need a lot of cash money to support uh, that many legionaries. And two, and I'm sure we'll get to this, but the army became a serious political issue for the empire, as in the emperors had to please the army or they would get uppity and overthrow him. And so the em emperor had to spend more and more of his attention on appeasing the army uh, and less attention to actually governing the empire and doing what was best for the empire. Because uh, giving out huge cash bonuses to every soldier will certainly make the army very happy, but it's probably not what's best for the treasury of the Roman Empire. 
large. What you say that doesn't make any sense? Well, because the army was so large and expensive, some modern historians estimate that up to 70% yeah. of the wow. state revenue had to be spent to upkeep and pay the around half a million professional soldiers of the Roman legions and auxiliaries. This worked well for a while, but as soon as major calamities befell the empire, such as plagues or barbarian mm. invasions, the state revenue consequently fell, yet the army still had to receive pay, else yep. the legions were very quick to rebel. That's exactly the point I was making. Sure, if everything's hunky-dory, that's fine. But if you enter a period of crisis and the Empire has less money to go around, well, the soldiers aren't going to accept less pay. In fact, they'll probably want more. And so what happens? Well, if you can't keep the legions happy, they rebel, you know, murder you, replace you with a new emperor, or they rebel until you agree to pay them and pay their bonus. So that can be a big issue, and it was a big issue. So to counteract this, starting already in the second half of the second century AD, the Roman Emperor started to debase the currency by using yep. less and less silver or gold in the coins, thus creating huge inflation. Yep, I mean, he's saying exactly what I would have said, but yeah, they debase the coins, which means they use less and less gold or silver for the coins over time. So, you know, ideally your gold coin should be 100% gold. But what would happen is that you know, they would use less gold for the coin, um, you know, they include some other elements, and so over time, your 100% gold coin becomes 90% gold, 60% gold, 50, 20% gold, and what that means is that it's technically worthless. People start to realize, wait a minute, this coin only has 20% gold in it, and so that means, you know, if, <laughs> you know, your coin is 20% gold, it used to be 100%, well, you're going to need five coins to pay for what one coin used to cost. And there we have inflation. This was one of the biggest issues the Roman Empire had. And I would say one of the major factors that led to its downfall. Which led to huge economic problems. I mean, look at that 5%. The coin is 5% gold. That's insane inflation. Which, of course, exacerbated the problems, a vicious cycle. Thus, counterintuitively, because the Roman army was just so massive, this would create huge economic problems that would ultimately contribute to the fall of Rome. The irony hmm. of history. What? Yeah, and, you know, the size of the army wasn't the only reason that the currency was debased over time. I mean, just those crises in themselves led to that debasement. But it certainly was a contributing factor that led to this inflation, which was really one of the death knells of the empire. It seems that there is a trend nowadays of whitewashing history. <laughs> Suddenly the Dark Ages were not so brutal yeah. after all. Instead, it was actually quite a pleasant time. Yeah, I, I think there's sort of an interesting medium to be found. So we don't want to overstate how bad things were, right? But I agree that there is sort of a trend of whitewashing history. Like people want to act like the Dark Ages were, well, they weren't that bad. They were, there was actually a lot of positives and this and that. And sure, it wasn't like an apocalyptic age of darkness. That's overstating it. But the Dark Ages were not a good time for particularly Europe. Um, the Byzantine Empire had its ups and downs, but now, of course, that doesn't go for the whole world, like some other places around the world were doing a lot better, but if we're looking at the Dark Ages in Europe, and that's generally what we're talking about, you know, they were dark, it was not a great period of time. Or the Germanic invaders who caused the fall of the Western Roman Empire were actually really friendly guys. They just were poor, innocent refugees who peacefully settled on the lands of the Western Roman Empire. Yeah, well, no. unfortunately... No, I mean, look, they weren't, like, monsters, um, but they were peoples migrating and expanding westwards. And so, I mean, yeah, there was a lot of fighting, a lot of battles, looting, raiding. I mean, you got to be realistic about it. The archaeological evidence of giant brutal battles between the Romans and the Germanic invaders, as well as the contemporary sources, do not confirm that rosy picture. In fact, in many cases, the opposite seems to have been the case. Countless cities in Gaul and Spain were brutally sacked, many Romans led into captivity and many killed. The Vandals were especially brutal in their conquest mm. of Africa as attested by contemporary historians. The narrative of a peaceful settlement of the Germanic invaders on Roman lands tells us more about modern ideological trends and our wish that all refugees are per definition super friendly than it does tell us about what actually transpired in these dark times. Yeah, sure, but once again you don't want to swing too far in the other direction. Um, you know, it is true that these people wanted to find a new place to settle, and the violence followed. 
Um, so I wouldn't necessarily call it, say, like senseless violence. And a lot of Romans remained afterwards, uh, and they were governed by these Germanic tribes. So there was some level of coexistence. So don't get it into your head that uh, the barbarian invaders went and killed every single Roman, and that they like that's not necessarily what happened either. But there was a lot of violence. That that's you know that's undeniable, and you definitely don't want to. We don't want to pretend that history is something that it isn't. We want to get the most accurate picture that we can, although that can be complicated at times. France still has its colonial empire in Africa. In the yes, 1960s, it does. when colonies were increasingly seen as barbaric, France had to grant independence to most of its colonies. Yeah, like the other European countries, I mean, Britain is the other best example. Uh, they were forced to decolonize throughout the middle of the 20th century, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and sometimes this was done more peacefully, sometimes it was done more brutally. Um, Portugal is a good example of a country that held onto its colonies for way too long. Now, you know, technically these colonies were all decolonized, but, you know, then of course we have the rise of neocolonialism where uh, a lot of the former masters of Africa are still sort of pulling the strings just a little bit more behind the scenes. Though, France is even more, like, they honestly are still fairly colonial. It's not even that hidden, and I think the short's going to show us that. But there was a catch. Each country that transitioned to independence had to sign a cooperation agreement with France yep. that outlined the future relationship between the two countries. In return for financial aid, the agreement allowed France the rights to the country's natural resources, as well as the stationing of troops in that country. See, this... <laughs> I don't even know if I'd call this neo-colonial. This just seems straight-up colonial to me. However, France also controlled the currency of its former colonies by forcing them to tie their currency, the CFA franc, to the French currency, the franc, or later mm. the euro. Since the implementation of the cooperation agreement, France has thought to bind its former colonies to itself by appointing leaders loyal to them and punishing countries that try to resist. Why was French Hillary Clinton there? <laughs> rule like Guinea. All of this is particularly damaging to the citizens of the former colonies, as the financial aid that France gives to those countries almost never ends up in the hands of the citizens. Yeah, I mean, like I said, a lot of former colonial countries, um, or a lot of big powers today, whether it be Britain, the United States, China, can be accused of neocolonialism. Absolutely. Um, France is a little more blatant with it. You know, they're not even really trying to hide it. Uh, they still maintain sort of these semi or fully colonial relationships with many of their former colonies. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty odd. Now, you may have heard a rumor that Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia, died in a compromising position with uh, the horse. Yeah. I feel like I don't have to explain that rumor. It's that she died while having uh, relations with a horse. I mean, that's basically exactly what they said. That's, of course, <laughs> nonsense. She died from a stroke, not horsing around. Yeah, a rumor spread afterwards. But then when exactly did this wild equine rumor attach itself to one of Europe's most beloved monarchs? Most beloved monarchs? I don't know about that. No, I mean... Look, Catherine had some very impressive accomplishments. I'm not a massive Catherine the Great fan, but you, I definitely won't downplay her achievements. Well, this specific story appeared without attribution a few years after Catherine's death, but it was only part of a larger smear campaign that continued throughout her reign. You see, Catherine had an active love life for an empress. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, so, and this is talking about some of her reputation while she was alive. Now, Catherine had many lovers, uh, as was normal for a monarch of that era. Um, kings would have many, many mistresses, and while, I mean, people didn't love it, it wasn't really a big deal. But, of course, Catherine was a woman, a very powerful woman. Um, and, obviously, there's very sexist attitudes uh, nowadays, but especially back in the 1700s. And so a lot of people would really emphasize how many lovers she had and sort of use that as a slight against her, even though they probably wouldn't have the same issue with uh, a king having so many lovers. And that was something that many Russians, especially powerful men, weren't used to. She right. had a series of lovers with affairs continuing into her 60s. Of course, had she been a man, this would have been considered pretty typical, but as a woman, Catherine was held to a sexist double standard. Mm. Though it's true that because these lovers were men, Catherine could appoint them to government positions, which never happened for a mistress. Yeah, I mean, look, many of Catherine's lovers would go on to serve her in a political sense. 
So, I mean, they were lovers. She was having fun, but she was also, you know, making political relationships at the same time. As a result, jealous nobles created overblown stories about her sexual voraciousness almost mm. nonstop because they were envious of their rival's advancement. For our full series on this extraordinary woman, click the link below. Now hmm, maybe I'll have to watch that. What was the Roman army's stance on homosexuality mm, in the military? The <laughs> I like the title, by the way, Being Gay in the Roman Army, How They Did It. Are we getting a tutorial, a step-by-step -step guide? <laughs> answer lies with general Roman ideas of sexuality, which focus less on the gender of individuals mm. involved and more on the proper status of the active partner. This is true. I mean, homosexuality was a big part of the ancient world. Uh, in Greece and Rome, which I'm more familiar with, homosexuality seems to have been uh, relatively common, or, I mean, at least not uncommon. You know, we have evidence of it. Um, and they're right, it's more about the proper status of each partner, but they're going to explain it, I think. For example, a free male citizen was expected to preserve their virtue by taking the dominant, active role in all relations. So long as this was the case, society generally accepted same-sex relations between free men and youth, yeah. slaves, social infamous, or others who were seen as beneath them. That's exactly right. So, homosexuality was only acceptable... Um, between two men if the dominant partner, the top, was a man of higher status and the submissive partner, the bottom, was someone who was beneath him. So, you know, slaves, someone inferior, or often, you know, youth, minors, young boys, um, which is obviously pretty disgusting from our perspective. Um, but that is how they viewed it in ancient Rome. That's the only way it could be acceptable if you were a man of high status and you were the submissive partner in the relationship, that was unacceptable. You know, that was not good. But if you were the dominant partner, then that was fine. Uh, it's, it seems like a very weird standard to us, but that's how they did it. Any role reversal, even in heterosexual relationships, was seen as shameful. Right. The Roman army followed this same approach. Because legionaries were all male citizens, their equal stature forbid them from same-sex relations, which mm. would necessarily shame one participant as the submissive member. However, they were free to pursue diversions outside of the military structure on their own time. Our records even report how Roman commanders such as Trajan and Hadrian were known yep. to love their wine and their boys. Stay tuned for an upcoming episode on these and more of Rome's gay emperors. Yep, I mean, you know, clearly homosexuality was present but it was very culturally different than it is today. So it's kind of fascinating. One of the most incredible technological achievements of the Roman Empire was the Roman road network. This interconnected mm. structure of roads was vital for the empire's economical and military. Right, sure. I mean, this was one of the most impressive infrastructure achievements of the ancient world. And it lasted a long time. And it connected uh, the, I don't know what you want to call it, the known world or the Roman world. ...military edge over the other empires or kingdoms of those days. During the peak of the Imperium Romanum, 372 great roads connected all provinces, comprising more than 400,000 kilometers of roads, of which 80,500 kilometers were stone paved. 29 Damn. great military highways branched out from Rome to all directions of the empire, ensuring fast military movement and quick reaction times to enemy threats at the borders. The and like I said, you know, these would last for a long time. These roads were used for hundreds, if not thousands, of years to come. Um, for, I mean, I know a bit about the Balkans. That's where uh, much of the Byzantine Empire's land was. You know, the Roman roads was one of the few ways that the Balkans stayed connected following the collapse of the West and the decline of the empire. The paved roads were built in layers with polygonal stones as the uppermost layer and they were built to last. The paved sections still survive in many places to this day and many mm. modern roads actually follow old Roman roads. There were even postal services which allowed people of those days to send letters with a speed of up to 100 kilometers per day. Every 25 to 30 kilometers there were wayposts or even mansiones which would be similar in function to modern day motels where travelers could stay overnight on their long journeys through the empire. And look, we talked about the Dark Ages in this video, uh, and this is something that uh, kind of adds to the evidence there, which is, you know, this sort of quick communication, this quick travel as the roads decayed over time, um, a lot of these services would no longer exist in medieval Europe. You know, the Roman Empire was so interconnected 
in a way that Europe would not be during the Dark Ages. You know, this is one of the things that was lost during that transition, uh, one of the many things. Can you guess the country from these five facts? All right, let's this do one more of these. One of the world's highest home ownership rates at around 96%. This place is one of the many countries that the Danube River flows through. This nation Ooh. is home to the world's heaviest building, weighing in over 4 million tons. Oh, this, this is tough. This place was a member of the Warsaw Pact during the Cold War. Yeah, I mean, we're all, we're getting a sort of Eastern Europe into Balkans region, but I, I don't know specifically who it is. I mean, this country used to be a Roman territory with their name originating from the Latin Romania. Romanus. Uh, the easy. The nation is Romania. I was thinking Romania, but the last one, the last one gave it to you. Uh, the Danube was sort of a hint. That made me think of Romania too, but it could have been many countries. Did you guess correctly? Can you? Uh, yes, I did, but you gave it to us with that last one. All right. Uh, I think that's all we have today. Uh, like I said, if you guys enjoyed this, please leave a like, leave a comment. Uh, if you want to send me more shorts or memes, uh, we have the comments down below, or you can send them to me on Twitter. My Twitter is linked in the description. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.